Our gospel comes from the 25th chapter of Matthew at verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing, was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are cursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me, naked, and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger or naked, or sick or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly, I will tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. <coughs> May our God in heaven further bless the reading from and the listening to his word. Amen. Amen. This morning we have a special um, we have a special opportunity to hear. Um, I've invited Colleen to share a little bit about. Um, anyway, I, she's going to share a little bit, and um, and we're going to and it and see and see if you can see how it connects to what we've been talking about in in worship the last the, today and the last couple of weeks. We can't hear you. Why can't we hear you? Colleen, I can't hear you. We should have tested. (laughs) 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 Oh, our best laid plans, right, people? (laughs) Trying to change it, but I... I'll put myself back so we don't look so silly. Well, while we while we deal with the technical difficulties here, <laughs> remembering. Um, did you guys see how 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 uh, how even more abundant our our display has become? As we as we re- reach this is a if you don't know what the, you can't tell what this is. This is a cabbage. And there's a mango just for some exoticism. And an onion. And bananas. 
There's apples and oranges. Lots of, and there's even a lemon up there as we remember these things as we. Um, no real Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. So I'm gonna, gonna, I'm gonna put your picture up and have your sound coming that way. How's that? Okay. All right. Perfect. Sorry about that, everyone. So the stewardship committee asked if I would share a brief testimony about using gifts to serve others, and and I think you know talking about using gifts sounds uh, for some people a little uncomfortable because it sounds like you're kind of brag. So look at me and look at my gifts. And um, I'm going to tell you that about 30 years ago, a college professor told me that I had a gift that was given to me by God. And it was an ability to speak Spanish that came to me almost naturally. A and I was flattered, but I didn't think much about it at the time. And I certainly didn't think it was going to land me in prison for about 30 years. So, you know, fast forward 30 years from that moment, or uh, actually 20 years from that moment, maybe 10. And, you know, I fell in with a questionable crowd, the Kairos crowd led by Joyce Garcia. And, you know, um, I used to hear them talk about going into prison and, and how much they enjoyed it. And pretty soon they um, asked me to do it as well. And, um, and I, I was afraid, I was afraid to do it. And so I said, sure, cause I didn't want to disappoint Joyce, but I, um, I put in my application, but I kept putting them off. And uh, every time an opportunity came up to go in, I, I had something else that I had to do. And so one Saturday evening, I was, I was praying before bed and I brought a concern that I had to God. I, I felt that I was losing my ability to speak Spanish because I didn't have any opportunities to use it. And um, so my prayer that evening was, Father, please show me how I can serve you sorry, and uh, use my Spanish. Well, I have this picture of God just laughing because he knew he had me. So the very next day, I was on the uh, Diaz Con Cristo board at the time, and the very next day, we had a board meeting, and the Kairos representative was giving the report, and she said she had an urgent need to bring before the community due to the large increase in Hispanic inmates in the Nevada prisons. Kairos was in desperate need of a volunteer who spoke Spanish, you know, so be careful what you pray for because you're going to get it probably in some uh, fashion or another. So it was one of those truly supernatural experiences where I felt God was speaking to me directly. And as always in my life, when I clearly see God's will and I surrender to it, I've been blessed beyond my, my wildest expectations by my time in the Kairos ministry. I've seen so much faith and strength, and it strengthened and, and developed my own faith. But as I reflect back on my years in Kairos, and especially in light of listening to this scripture from Matthew, I realized that, that while it was a special gift that God gave me that got me there in the first place, uh, it's not an extraordinary skill that allows me to be there. It, it's quite the opposite. It's quite ordinary. Matthew 25 um, 36 tells us that when we visit those in prison, we're visiting Jesus. When we give those uh, who are thirsty a drink, when we clothe the naked and feed the hungry, very simple acts, because the only real special skill I needed to do my Kairos ministry was the willingness to walk through those gates and be present. When people ask me why I do Kairos ministry, my answer is always quite simple. I simply can. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Colleen. Thank you. And uh, thank you for using the gifts that God has given you, uh, even to speak to us and uh, we can see your passion. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our redeemer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. A phrase comes to mind. It's actually more of a proverb. Not, not one of those proverbs from the Bible, but one of those proverbs that we humans have made up to, to help us with our understanding of how it is that we live in this world and uh, in many ways how we live out our faith. And that proverb that I hear in my head this morning 
is that charity begins at home. But I also hear this impl the implied ending to that phrase, right? Do you hear it too? And so, and it ends there, right? Because many times when I hear people use that phrase, it's sort of a, well, you can't argue if, you know, you have to begin here at home and, and, and why would we bother with anyone else? Sort of is the inferred expectation. And in some ways, this, this is one of those phrases that comes up in those tests about what's biblical and what's not. Have you ever d taken one of these? There's, there's several of them on the, on the internet these days where you can, you can say, say, is this, uh, this phrase that we all, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness. Did you guys know that's not in the Bible? <laughs> Thank goodness. Thank goodness it's not in the Bible, right? But this is another one that people ascribe to the Bible. And there are some phrases that talk about um, caring for, 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 for family and making, making a priority to do the work that is before you. But, but no matter what the internet says, th really the first time that this phrase existed, came into existence, is, is written down, is in Thomas Brown's book, Religio Medici, which was written in 1642. So it is an old phrase. <laughs> our grandmothers and our great-grandmothers and our great-great-great-great-great-grandparents may have used this phrase as well. But he was actually arguing against the way we use it today. And he said, charity begins at home is the voice of the world, meaning if you start, if, if you are charitable at home, you, you begin to see the world differently. The Bible, remember, is quite vocal that we are called to love, right? So, so it makes more sense that, 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 that we are called to love might extend farther out, right? That, that, that charity beginning at home and stopping there is not the intent of God's kingdom. Because we're quite, the Bible is quite vocal. It says we're, not, we're called to love not just our family and friends and not just the neighbors, but even our enemies. And even the Old Testament laws that sometimes we, we think the Old Testament is full of things that are about, about um, judgment and, and, and God's anger. But even the Old Testament laws lay a foundation for justice and generosity for the marginalized, like the widows and orphans and foreigners. The other thing that's inherent in this saying, the way we have come to use it, is that there is a dichotomy, that, there is a, uh, that there's an inference that we can't care for both ourselves and for others. Here to say that's not true, right? Just because we care for someone else doesn't mean we can't care for a third person, right? And in fact, isn't that what God, Jesus tells us? That, that we are to be expansive and that we are expanding in our generosity and love. Compassion is not a zero-sum game. We can stand for one cause or value and stand for many, many more. We can hold the tension of caring for so much. The other thing about this phrase is that language has changed, right? That what we understand charity now to mean, you know, giving to charity, right? That's basically what it comes to mean, right? Giving to a, a, to a cause or, or um, that sort of thing. It makes the sense sound very weird when we say charity begins at home because it's the exact opposite of the definition, isn't it? A better translation for this word, the, the word that perhaps we need to hear this morning, and perhaps it's the word we've heard before, and I know, I've, I, I know this for sure, it's the word is love, right? Love begins at home is a much better, much better saying, and it might actually help us remember that it doesn't end there. And, and, and at the very heart of what a proverb is, of what, our, uh, what, this, 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 what a proverb is about, is about helping us cultivate values in everyday life. 
So what if we said lo practicing love, practicing charity, practicing these things it will help us to be learning to be compassionate and charitable people from home, where we develop this capacity and that grows as we exercise it outside of our front door and outside of our back door and down the street and around the world. Charity at home then just be becomes the beginning and the, becomes the way of life, the way of love. I think that this is where Jesus was trying to get to this morning. When, when he thinks about the, when I think about this parable, this parable that we have here, it's sort of on the very edges of the parable form, right? There's not so much a story as there is, is, a, is an example, but it is, a, nevertheless, it is, a, it is a part of the scripture that helps us to understand what the kingdom of God looks like, and so it's a parable. So our parable this morning is a story about what happens if we let lo love stop at the doors of our home. Jesus begins this story at some far off time of judgment, a separate and a separation that a separation of people will commence. Like a shepherd, like a shepherd, right? Like that's the example. Then the goats go one way and the sheep go another way, and some will inherit the kingdom prepared for them because they have noticed when there was a hungry person in front of them and they gave them food and there was thirst and they gave a drink and there was a stranger who they welcomed a naked person whom they gave clothing to those who were sick and needed to be tended a prisoner who needed to be visited now, in the parable, some are confused, and they're, they're going, when were you? We don't remember this moment when you, Jesus, were hungry, thirsty, a stranger, naked, sick, or in prison. What do you mean we fed you? What do you mean we gave you water? What do you mean we welcomed you? And Jesus says, you did it even before you knew that's what I expected of you. You did it because that's the practice you had become imbued in. You had been formed in the face of mercy, in the, in the shape of mercy, and had not let that be contained. Jesus says, you did it for the least of these. You did it when you didn't, and when you didn't know it was me. You did it for me. And then he's going to turn to the others and he's going to say, they're going to be just as confused because they didn't see Jesus sick or hungry or thirsty or a stranger or in prison because they saw no one or they saw someone and decided it wasn't of them. It wasn't part of, it wasn't within their power, within their mercy, within their love to do something different. The parable tells us it'll be too late, right, when we get to that day to decide that's what we should have been doing. Right? And it's not like, 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 like I think sometimes we think of this, the nature of this as, as do it or, or you're going to miss, you know, when you die, you go to hell, right? And really, really what Jesus is saying here is to do it, to enter into the joy now is so much better. We heard in Colleen's story, right, the transformation and the, and the, the impact it had on her, right? This, this being molded and, and, and made and created by love, beginning as the very foundation and not letting that be the end. Think of what that does for the kingdom of God. Those who've allowed love to form them, in the parable or around us, we know these people, right? These are the people you look at and go, I want some of that. 
These are the people whose lives you look at and you say, whoa. These are the people who others might not see. But you catch in these moments of grace, offering grace and mercy and yes, love. And you become overwhelmed. Because you are close to the kingdom of God in those moments. You are, you are having a taste of the kingdom life. Those who have allowed love to shape them, to form them in a spirit of mercy, risk living and dying and rising with Jesus. Not waiting for another world to come. Not waiting for the circumstances to be perfect, for the calendar to be perfectly organized, for your cupboards to be perfectly organized, for the floors to be clean. No, it happens now. Not waiting, right? This Sunday is in the church year, the Christ the King Sunday. And what this means is that this is the end, the, school, the end of the end of the year. It's time for some New Year's resolutions for the people of faith. It's time to remember that God is not yet done. You see, those who allow love to form them, I hope you want to be the people whom love forms, have entered into the joy of the master, of God, without even knowing it sometimes, right? That's that first group of people going, what do you mean we did that? We just, we just did what we were supposed to do. We just did the just and right and wonderful thing. You have entered the joy of the master. And that's not saying it's perfect, that life is perfect, that everything is perfect. But I will say that when we enter the joy of, of, of the Lord, when we enter into the kingdom of God, the glimpses and the, and the, the seasons and the, and the, the sinkholes, the, the, the possibilities of the kingdom of God among us, even as we sometimes we have suffering and sometimes there's danger and risk and tribulations and disappointments, it also comes with joy. Those of you who have ever met somebody, or maybe this is your story, you always thought that you should be, that you should, that, that giving, giving something away, whether it be a tangible item or, or love or compassion to another, was a pointless activity. Would do nothing for you, nothing for your spiritual life. Maybe you've met that person who's done that who finally let go and let God do something with something. And it's not that what happens with that gift is important, although it is valuable and significant and wonderful. But what happens in your spirit, what happens in your living is transformed. Formed in a spirit of mercy, we gain a taste of the kingdom life. A, a glimpse of the kingdom of God, a glimpse of just how powerful that is. And those who miss those in need around them, those who lived a li live a life with blinders on, live a life closed off to others and close others off. You see, our gifts and our graces, those, 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 those nudges and those shoves that we have in our lives towards the kingdom of God are so valuable, are so significant, are so deeply connected to who we are and whose we are. This morning, we have an offering plate full of commitment cards, mm. uh, of, of commitment cards, of, of, of people's faith and, 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 um, and, a, and a pile of fruit that talks about what we are thankful for. These, th this is a part of the way that we allow mercy 
and love and grace to shape us. Just one of the ways, right? But this is one of the ways we celebrate together as a community, the ways in which we let go and let God do more than we can imagine. Through us, in us, and in spite of us, right? Where we, where we, where we are allowed and, and have the connection with, with people and time and place to pull us out of ourselves and into the fullness of who God calls us to be. The way we can do that as a community and the way we do that as individuals. The way some of us are leading, that, leading the group at, at any one point, right? Some of us are more open in some days and some, some other days we get, we get frustrated. And the community pulls us into that way of mercy, the way of peace, the way of joy, the way of God. This morning, as we dedicate these gifts of prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness, and we will do that in a minute after we sing some music, we are formed by love in that spirit of mercy to be taken unexpected places, to the places of God's suffering in the world, living God's mercy out, but also into the places of God's joy. Amen? Amen.